Hello, 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 folks. I'm Philip Magnus, and today I will be talking about a book I'm very excited about, Shards of Earth by Adrian Tchaikovsky. I had the pleasure to read it thanks to NetGalley, and I'm taking part in an ultimate blog tour very, very soon, but this isn't that post. This is my review. The post itself you will see on my blog, the Grimoire Reliquary, and it will be all about, I hope, tropes. Tropes in Shards of Earth. But let's jump into the review itself. Shards of Earth is Adrian Tchaikovsky's first bona fide attempt at a space opera, the opening to his final architecture trilogy, and one of the best science fiction books I've read this year. Tchaikovsky's ambitions for this series are made clear very early on. Shards opens with a story of cosmic struggle against an enemy so vast, even humanity's most advanced weaponry does no more than pimprick them. The architects are, I quote, moon-sized entities that can reshape populated planets and ships, end quote, as per the glossary, into crystalline sculptures of staggering and repulsive beauty. These cosmic leviathans are utterly unaware of the uncountable lives snuffed out in the process of the transformations they induce. The first world, targeted by these staggering intelligences, is none other than Earth. And so Tchaikovsky's future version of humanity is orphaned from its cradle, which has turned into which has turned it into little more than a confederation loosely held together by multiple factions who all have varying interests under the name Hugh, which stands short for the Council of Human Interests, by the time the crux of this narrative picks up. Forty years have passed since intermediary Idris and two of his siblings at last managed to make contact with one of the architects, and so have bought humanity a reprieve. The issue here is that no one quite knows how long this reprieve will last. This very same Idris, working now as navigator atop a shabby vessel by the name of the Vulture God, makes the deep space discovery of a vessel that has gone through the same crystallization process as so many of humanity's central worlds did in that great war. The discovery sets off a series of events that affect, as you will imagine, forces far outside the Vulture's crew. While this is an overt simplification of one main thread of the narrative, Tchaikovsky tells a far more intricate story. By the point the Vulture makes its discovery, the ship's crew has picked up a new recruit, point of view character Solace, a Myrmidon executor of the Parteni, the genetically engineered sisterhood of humanity, battle angels sworn to the defense of human space and the most militarily advanced strand of, humani of humankind. The nation of Partenon is composed of genetically grown women, who are considered by their creator to be an ideal version of humanity. For that very reason, they are feared by much of their non-bioengineered cousins, especially by the nativist faction and their extremist uh, subgroup, the Betrayed. The nativist you might think of as far-right, and the Betrayed you, well, you might think of as uh, far, far worse. During the Great War, all of humanity was held together by the common threat of the architects. Forty years later, fractures between the two strands of humanity have widened to the point that tensions might give way to open war at the least provocation. The Parthenon's one great disadvantage is that they lack intermediaries of their own, those capable of travelling outside the true ways and into deep space at a faster than light speed. Solus has a history with Idris from all the way back in the war, when the int was her responsibility to look after. Pulled into activity pulled 
Pulled into active duty from cryosleep, she's been sent to make Idris an offer, one he may not be able to refuse. Solus has a history with Idris from all the way back in the war, when the int was her responsibility to look after. Pulled into active duty from cryosleep, she's been sent to make Idris an offer, one he may not be able to refuse. Here's the essence of Parthenon as described by Solus herself. I know that in the colonies they say a lot of things about my people. I've seen the Hue propaganda too. We're warmongers, we're man-haters, we're unnatural, born in a lab indoctrinated, programmed like machines, all that I've heard. And nobody remembers we died for the colonies above a hundred worlds during the war. We were the line. And the softer edges of her voice were ablating off, revealing only steel beneath. Triss belatedly remembered this wasn't just third generation ancestral pride. Solus had been there. She had fought in the war, faced the architects. We were the shields and swords of the colonies, the Parthenon went on. And then, when the war was over, you started asking why we had to keep on being different to you. Why couldn't we just come back and be your wives and daughters again? You really think we quit you because we had some designs on your planet? Because we wanted to line all your menfolk up against a wall and make everyone else like us? We left because you hated us and would have used your laws to break us if we'd stayed. All we ever did was put our lives on the line for you and you still hate us for it. After a quote like this, I bet at least a few of you know if Charles of Earth will work for you. But you see, I haven't even mentioned the FTL travel. In true space opera fashion, it is a common occurrence. Tchaikovsky uses the concept of unspace to have the races of his galaxy cut through vast swaths of cosmic space. Staying awake during voyages through unspace holds dangers all its own. For anyone who has braved it feels an uncanny presence, seeking, searching to close the distance. There's something of Warhammer 40k's warp there, something Lovecraftian too. Presented in such a way as to be novel rather than tired. The explanations that this is a shared experience triggered by the staggering aloneness at play here and I say aloneness because whenever a shipful of people transitions in unspace, what every single person who is not in uh, asleep, basically, in pods, what every single one of these people experiences is this incredible feeling of being alone. When you're in unspace, no matter whether you were crowded with people before or not, you are all of a sudden alone. Everyone is sort of in a different instance and, as you might imagine, this experience, which some in the book world would describe as hallucinogenic in nature, rings very false indeed, as we will see in this quote. The fact that everyone who came out of unspace, sane and hell, reported the same delusion was not a comfort. Because Chris couldn't stop thinking. Surely there was only one logical explanation to everyone having the same experience. That, despite everything, there really was something out there. Unspace had a single and inimitable denizen. And she was trapped in here with it. Now I can almost hear the strings of a horror haunted play somewhere in the background as I read these lines. Humanity is, however, far from alone. Rather, it is part of a bustling galactic community, which is often enough at odds. In addition to the strands of humanity under hue and pattern and control, there's the hegemony, a much older civilization controlled by the inscrutable Essiel, possessing the knowledge to protect worlds from the architect's transformative touch the Essiel seek to expand their control over humanity, but they're unwilling to do so through their strength in arms, electing instead to persuade through the promise of safety 
and harmony. We never see a proper ASIL-controlled world, but the hegemony's culture promises to be a starkly different one compared with the bustling, staggeringly, uh, staggering multitudes humanity has to offer. There's also the Hivers, autonomous distributed artificial intelligences created by humanity but now with distinct goals and interests of their own. The unkillable killing machines that are the Tosiat, the crab-like Hanilambra, or Honey, aliens, and several others I won't get further into. I reserve a special place for the originators, however. An ancient spacefaring race responsible for the true ways, as well as fascinating artifacts and ruins whose every mention and exploration fed me some serious nostalgia from my adventuring days aboard Mass Effect's Normandy. Plenty of that if you are a space opera fan. Shards of Earth recalls the very best of the genre, makes familiar tropes fresh and new, and folds in nicely next to other works by the author. I've seen Tchaikovsky deal with some of the themes touched in Shards of Earth before. Vast intelligences that find it difficult even to acknowledge human existence reared their... Um, attractive heads, I suppose, in the Doors of Eden. Further, both the dangers of capitalism, pushed to 11, as well as the possibility of distributed intelligence networks growing far more complex than intended and acquiring personhood made for the thesis statement of Dogs of War. The book's characters are ridiculously easy to root for. In addition to Idris and Solus, we've got Chris Almir, a lawyer as deadly with a knife as she is with her words, Oli Timo, a mechanic and specialist whose ingenious use of robotics allows her to overcome her physical disabilities, and the Vulture God's captain, Rollo Rostand, whose dialect has a number of peculiarities which define space of speech in ways that read across as a natural drift away from our own use of language. It's not quite the Beltalorda speak from the Expanse, but it has a ring to it, and a rhythm, which I found very pleasing. Perhaps not everyone will. You know, we all react in different ways when it comes to our um, reactions to made-up languages or to shifts in the language we use in SFF literature. But for me, it was an excellent, excellent edition. There are a few others, an alien, a hiver, and the crew dynamics between them, all of them, are exactly what you'd hope they would be. They feel like a family, even when they're at each other's throats. Whether the focus is on Ollie and Solace's very different understandings of what the part any way of life entails, the bond between Solace and Idris, neither of whom look to have aged a single day since the time of the Architect War 40 years ago, or Chris's clever tongue lashing, which might be aimed at just about everyone, inside and outside the confines of the Vulture God, these characters work together perfectly. If you grew up with Star Wars or Star Trek, They'll feel like home, reminiscent of the crews of the Millennium Falcon and the Enterprise. As well as Firefly. Firefly it would be another good example. It might actually be the closest one. Uh, the dangers of this galaxy go far beyond the civilization-ending threat of the Architects. From a rogue Essiel to a nobleman, from one of humanity's most prosperous worlds to a secretive operator of Hughes Intelligence Service, Mordent House, the threats to the Vulture Gull's crew come in many different shapes and sizes. The dangers of this galaxy go far beyond the civilization-ending threat of the Architects. From a rogue Essiel to a nobleman, from one of humanity's most prosperous worlds, to a secretive operator of Hughes Intelligence Service, Morden House, the threats to the Vulture Gull's crew are numerous and multifaceted. Action scenes are written with a precision I envy, often shock with the suddenness and brutality and engender in the reader a sense of danger for everyone involved. 
I recall a point early on when I realized just how the high just how high the stakes were. And the words that made me do so also made me do a double take. They're still burned in my mind. I can immediately recall them, but I'm not going to because they are very, very spot heavy. The environs, different planets, the crew is trussed between the majestic ships and the crepid space stations are all memorable. Here is an excellent description that showcases some of my favorite features of Tchaikovsky's writing. Jericho was the last habitable world to be found by explorers from Earth, before there was no longer an Earth to be from. A survey team exploring a dead-end, true way burst into a virgin system. They found a planet a little closer than Earth to a sun a little cooler than Earth's. Then they found a biosphere crammed full of a riotous life whose biochemistry overlapped with Earth by at least 40%. An Eden surveyors crowd. Then the planet's biochemistry ate two of the landing party and they quickly revised their estimate to a monstrous death world. But there were still scientific grants for that and a permanent research presence was established only months before an architect appeared over the skies of Earth. That research team was intended to be the sole presence on Jericho, an opportunity to conduct pure research into a thriving alien ecology, untouched by humanity save the luckless surveyors. The nerd fell, the polyospora began, and Jericho received its shipments of refugees, same as everywhere else. Establishing a colony on planet was not the nature read in Toots and Claw experience everyone had expected. Desperate humans in need of a home could Toot and Claw ride back, and twice as hard. The clarity of description, the wry wit. I can't describe to you how many times I've cackled hysterically at some passage or another in Charles Vert. Allow me to point out also that I love books that pack a glossary at the end. This one has a timeline slapped at the very back of the glossary as well, which makes for some encyclopedical reading, preferably after you've finished the novel itself. I loved getting most of this information through dialogue, description and voice. Seeing it then presented chronologically makes for an excellent reference tool for later. Adrian Tchaikovsky shows a craftsman's care and a visionary's imagination in constructing this universe. He does so while rounding up the first part of this trilogy in such a way as to make of it a gratifying experience that doesn't frustrate you to no end for not having the second book immediately at hand. You should get this one if you love the genre, and if you're a newcomer curious about space opera or sci-fi overall, this is a Phenomenal title to start your interstellar journey with. Now, be honest with me. Do you want me to tell you more about Shards of Earth? I'd be happy to take a look at uh, one of my favorite fight scenes. I could do a character profile or two. I could present even a spoiler discussion. And if you're a fellow YouTuber who... Or rather a booktuber who would like to take part in that, let me know. What do you feel like? Tell me in the comments and don't forget to like this video, share it with your friends and press on that subscribe button, ring the bell for notifications and I will see you again next time. Philip Magnus out. Bye!